The Gemara tells us in Megillah that Ezra has so fair, Ezra the scribe instituted that before Rosh Hashanah we should read the Tochacha, the portion of rebuke. That is, we read it twice. We read it at the end of Sefer Vayikra Parshas Bichukosai, and we read it at the end of the Book of Dvarim Parshas Kisavo. And why did Ezra institute to read the Tochacha? He wanted to get the curses over with, and therefore we could start the new year fresh. So in fact, the Gemara tells us in Megillah why, why Emaf Sikim Akolos? Why, why the Gemara gives us different halachas in terms of the Tochacha? So the Gemara tells us why Emaf Sikim Akolos? So the Gemara gives us two reasons. In other words, the Gemara Megillah is talking about giving people an aliyah. So we know the meaning is on Shabbos we give extra aliyahs. We give seven and then we give extra. And it's okay. But over here the Gemara says, Ain maf seekin bekolos. Don't break up the kolos. Don't break it up. So why? In other words, don't call up someone new and then, then stop and then call someone up again. So why not? So the Gemara says two reasons. One is, it's inappropriate when God's giving you rebuke to put the pause button on and say, God, wait a second. Um, I'm not in the mood to hear it now. You know, I want to go out, I want to watch the game now. I have something to do. I'll catch the, re- I'll catch the rest of the rebuke later. So it's inappropriate to cut God off. And Rish Lakis gives another reason. He says, Imaf Sikim Bekolos, he says, because... We don't want Shein Mivarchin Ala Prinios. We don't want to make added brachas on something which is a punishment. The Tochacha is not a happy occasion. The Jews are going to be punished. So if I, if we, if we make a so the person who finishes the and gets his, makes his bracha Rona, and the new person gets his own bracha. So therefore, we're adding extra brachas. So we don't want to add new brachas in the Tochacha. And where else um, do we find this concept of not adding brachas to the Tochacha or to a Dabara? So we find in other areas. For instance, there's a mitzvah in the Torah of Hashavetz Gezela. You have a mitzvah to return your stolen object. Aye, so where's the bracha? When you return the stolen object, you get a mitzvah in the Torah. But since the only way you got to do this mitzvah is by doing an Avera. So we don't want to make a bracha on something which is associated with an Avera. Or Hashavah's Aveda, not even an Avera, but let's say someone lost an object and it fits into all the different laws and you have to return it. Aye, do we make a bracha when we return a lost object? No, why not? So again, because the tsar of another person that Someone else lost this object, who knows, it's very important to them, and now you're going to make a bracha on, on the tsar of someone else. We don't do that, like bikar cholim, visiting the sick. It's a tremendous mitzvah, and your presence there helps them, but we don't want to make a bracha on something which is, a, which is associated with someone else's tsar. And similarly, we find the Rambam writes, the Rambam has a chiddish, but the Rambam writes, that one is permitted to use a shofar gazula, a stolen shofar. Of course, if there's no other option, he says one can use it. He's not, he's not condoning stealing. He's talking legally speaking. If the only shofar available is a stolen shofar, so then you could use it. But he makes one caveat. He says, but no bracha. Because since it's associated with an avera, we don't make a bracha. So we find this cloud that any type of we don't make a brach on prinios and on davara. In fact, we're in the, we're getting close to Rosh Hashanah and Sarah Shemay Tshuva. So the Ramban writes, in fact, it's this, this week's parasha, Ki HaMitzvah HaZos. The Torah tells us, this mitzvah, lo rechokari, it's not far away, it's not me'ever hayam, but it's very close. Beficha uvavavcha la'asoso. With our belt and with our heart we could do it. So what mitzvah are we talking about? The Rashi quotes the Gemara in Erevin. 
It's talking about the mitzvah of Torah, Talmud Torah. The Ramban disagrees and says it's talking about the mitzvah of tshuva. Tshuva, it's not too far. It's in everybody's reach. One could fulfill um, the mitzvah of tshuva. And in fact, that's what the Ramban points out. I'm that's always on time. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the Ramban, you heard that Johnny's always on time. So that's what the, that's what the Ramban writes, we're talking about the mitzvah of tshuva. That's what this mitzvah is. So the question is, according to the Ramban, it's a biblical mitzvah to do tshuva, to whatever tshuva means exactly, that's to say, to repent, to become a better person. So how come then there's no bracha? Normally we make a bracha. On a mitzvah in a Torah, we make a bracha. We even make brachas on rabbinical mitzvahs, and certain times even on customs. So why is it then that there's no bracha on the mitzvah in a Torah of tshuva? So there are many answers, but one answer along the lines as we're explaining is because usually if you did if you're doing tshuva, what does that mean? That means you did something wrong, even though. Not necessarily, because you could do tshuva on something that you did right, except you want to do it better. But tshuva is usually associated with alchei shachatanu ufanecha, ashamnu. So we don't want to make a bracha on something which is associated with avera, with sin, hence no bracha. So getting back, that's what we explained. Ezra instituted to read the portion of rebuke before Rosh Hashanah, so we could end the year with curses and begin the new year with blessings. And then we have halacha, we don't break up the tochacha. We, you know, usually on Shabbos we get called up, especially at a simcha, you have a hundred aliyahs. And the Gemara says when it comes to the tochacha, we don't break we don't break it up. How come? So the first answer is because it's inappropriate. God's giving us rebuke, and we're going to put God on the pause button, so that's inappropriate. Or the second reason we gave is we don't want to add more brachas. If we break up the tochacha, then we're going to end up, the guy's going to finish his last bracha and the new person's going to get a new aliyah. This a question is, what, but that's a later institution. Originally, the way it worked is, you called up Yale for Kohen. You, you called up everyone, you called up, and you called up Levi. So you called up the seven aliyahs, but no one got brachas. Yale just read the first, the Baruch Hu, and then the Ashabach Chabana Mikol. And the guy who finished off, he made the last bracha, Shanasangano Torah Semes. So what is so Bishlom and now I understand Reish Lakish, because we make brachas, but Bizban HaGemara, what's 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 Reish Lakish talking about? They have to add on brachas. What kind of brachas? Don't we, we don't add any brachas. The first person starts it and the last person finishes it. So what does the Gemara mean? So so the so two schools of thought. So so the Rishonim right that it wasn't so black and white, that the only that was true. It's true, if everyone was in shul at the beginning when they read the Torah and you heard the Cohen's first bracha, that covered everyone. But let's say you walked in for a shishi and, you, and you're just showing up now and they called you up for an aliyah, so then you have to make your own bracha. How could you rely on his bracha? You didn't even hear it. So some Rishonim learn it's not carved in stone and it's not that just the way it is. In general rule, we try to, one person made a bracha for everybody, but it doesn't mean to say that this is, this is true. I love it. The other school of thought says, you didn't make brachas. So if you didn't make brachas, so therefore, what's the Gemara talking about? That we don't want to add brachas on perennial. So, so perhaps it's based on another issue. Is we said it's a, we're used to the practice today, we read the Torah all the time, meaning... We read the Torah every week. We read a whole parsha every week. The original institution in Yushalayim was they used to do a third, let's so say, Bereshis the first week, one third of Bereshis, next week the second third of Bereshis, the next week, the, and it used to take him three years to finish the Torah. So uh, oh. that's the way it used to be. You know, in, Yush, in, you know, in Bava we had a different practice. So. So therefore, according to us, we knock off two birds with one stone. It always is the, we do everything in one year. So we're used to reading Parshas Kisavu, Parshas Shavua now. But during the first year, who could? That could have been in the middle of Shmos. 
So that's it was a special Takanis Ezra, no matter where you were in the parsha, you went ahead and you read this the, you read the parsha of the rebuke. That's what they did. And that's why in that case you make a bracha. That's a, it's a separate institution. There's a regular institution reading the parsha, but independently there was a separate institution, Takanis Ezra, like the Aseris Hadibras. So that's why we make, um, that's why um, even according to the time of Gemara, it's possible you could add bracha. So that's what the Gemara says, that Ezra instituted that we read the Tochacha before Rosh Hashanah. So there's a fundamental difference between the Tochacha in Parshas Bechukosai and the Tochacha, the portion of rebuke in Parshas Kisavo. Now what is the Gemara... So what do we see? That Parshas Bichakosa ends with hope. <coughs> At the end of the rebuke, it says. Kisavo? No, Bichakosa. And the Eschorus Brisi will remember the Brisavos, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Don't forget about us. So even though it's bad, but, we, but we're left with the remembering our forefathers. But when it comes to Kisavo, the one we just read, very abrupt ending, not a good one. You'll have no one you want to be bought as slaves, no one's going to want you, and that's it, it'll be the end. So the, qu- the question is, why is it when it came to Parshas Bichol Kosai, we have, it ends with hope, but it comes to Parshas Kisavo, it doesn't end with hope. So, you know, different commentators um, give different explanations. So some explain that Parshas Bechukosai, it's Bekeri, it seems to be a circumstance, happenstance. Like, you know, like in the parasha, you don't, it's not clear that God is doing it. So we know what, what's the saddest month on the Jewish calendar? What month? Oh. Right. Adr is the happiest, and of, you know, not on a personal level, but on a Jewish, so of, an interesting of, with the Tisha B'av, the two temples destroyed, all the terrible suffering, of means father. So its irony is that you know it's the kind of like it's it's a punishment out of love. It's a father. Like how do you know? I say there was a guy riding um, down the street, and this kid <coughs> ran, a, jumped right in front of the car. You know the ball came out, and he just jumped in front of the street. So the guy in the car started screaming at the kid, "What are you doing? You almost killed yourself." And I didn't want to kill you, so he gave him a rebuke. Okay, and that was it. He went on. It happened again. Another guy screamed at him, and he went on. The third time it happened, a different, two different people. The third guy, he got out of his car and he started chasing this kid. He chased him three blocks and gave him a good old-fashioned whooping, some panches. What was the difference? The last guy was the father. I mean, the other one's scared, but I don't get to scream at the kid. But they're not going to get out of their car and inconvenience themselves. If it's your own child going ahead and doing something dangerous, you're going to make sure. As you also much get sued. Exactly. If you hit somebody else's kid. You might even get sued to hitting your own kid. <laughs> <laughs> We're in a different world today. But then they'll say, hit them, I get out, give them the... But the point being is that the first passage, Bichu Kosai, looks like it's circumstantial. I need all the nechama, all the comfort I need. But if you know God's giving you the pachis, that itself is a nechama. That itself is a comfort. And that's why he suffers from God, and it's clear, so therefore you don't need... A nechama, because that's by definition your parent, your parent because they love you. That's why they're giving you the pachis. What do you mean by nechama? A comfort, like you know. So that's that's one explanation. But Salavechik had a different one. I bet you this one's better. <laughs> so he explains that they really they both end with comfort. What do you mean? But I don't see the comfort in Parashas Kisavo. You have to look. Do. You have to look into this week's parsha. He says it's 50 psukim later. It's the uh, Nitzavim is a continuation. And if you look, and it says that basically the Jewish people, when they repent, oh, you know, will do tshuva and miyad nigolam, and, and God will redeem them. So there is, um, there is a nechama. So then the question is, okay, so how come when it comes to Bichu Kosai, the comfort comes immediately? But in Parashat Kisava, we have the break. We have to wait 50 psukim, so to speak, until we get the nechama. So Rav Salvezhik explained based on the Ramban, the Ramban writes the difference between the first Tochacha and the second one is that it goes back, it 
relates back to history. Parashat Bichachosai relates to Chorban Bayez Rishon, to the destruction of the first temple. So we know the first temple was finite. That we Very said, short we said 70 years. And you know, there might be some discussion how you count those 70 years. But everyone agrees it was going to be a 70 year time period and they started rebuilding the temple. So the Bayez Rishon was finite. So to here, you got your rebuke, okay, right after we'll give you in the Chama. But Bayesheni was still waiting. Right now, you know what the pause in between Kisava and Yitzavim is? That's the time we're in right now. As the Rambam says, it's in our hands. In fact, the Rambam, the Ramban writes, this week's parasha, Kiyah Mitzvah Zos, is the Mitzvah of Tshuva. There's, the Rambam doesn't write, per se, there's a Mitzvah of Tshuva. And some explanations write, because he says, how could the Mitzvah, how could tshuva has to be free choice? Yet the Torah is giving us a nevua. There will come a time in history when the Jews will do tshuva and miyad negolam. So the Ram, so the, the way some Achronim learn the Rambam, there is no mitzvah of tshuva because tshuva, you need free choice. The Torah is telling it's going to happen. Others point out in the Rambam, why, isn't, why doesn't the Rambam have a mitzvah of tshuva? The Mesha Chachma. He says, what do you mean tshuva? Let's say you, you, you didn't keep Shabbos. So I'm going to do Tshuva. Next week I'm going to keep Shabbos. Nothing to do with Tshuva. The obligation of observing Shabbos mandates that you keep Shabbos next week, whether you did Tshuva or not. In other words, I ate tray. If now I'm going to do Tshuva, I'm going to eat kosher. What do you mean you did Tshuva? You're going to do... You have to eat kosher because the Torah commands. So he says, by definition, he says, there's no... What is, what is, there's no mitzvah of tshuva. It's a prerequisite. Obviously, it's built into a mitzvah that you're going to have to, if you're gonna, that you have to keep Shabbat, 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 kosher. But either way, that's what Rav Salvation explains, that there's, there's a comfort in both. But why is there a break in between? Because one relates to the Chorban by Yisrishon, which is finite, and one relates to the Chorban by Yisheni. And in fact, interesting, um, in the Pasuk, on this week's Parsha, of Kiya Mitzvah Hazos, which is referring to Ramban, is referring to Tshuva. So there's a, when one of the Hasidic Sherebeim point out an interesting contrast between, um, we say, what's the, if you look at the Pasuk, it says, Kikarov Hadava Miyod, Beficha Uvovav Chalasoso. So it says the word Kikarov Hadava Maod is first, Beficha with my mouth is second. Bovavcha is last. Right. So he wants to contrast to another Pasuk we say all the time in Kriyashma. Which Pasuk am I referring to? Bechol Lovavcha, Bechol Nafshecha, or Bechol Modecha. Bechol Lovavcha, as Rashi writes, Shnei Yisiros. You know, we have a, you know, we have a heart, you know, to serve Hashem. Bechol Nafshecha, Bechol Lovavcha, Bechol Nafshecha, Nefesh. That's the same thing the Targum writes, what's the, what's the greatness of a human being? That the fact that we could talk. That's a nefesh. That's, so talking and nefesh are the same. And v'chol modecha with all our money. So the Divra Yechezko asks, it's totally the opposite order. When it comes to Shema, we say first, l'vavcha, then, then nefesh, talking, and then modecha. But in this week's parasha, when we talk about the mitzvah of tshuva, ki a mitzvah azos, it says, Kikarov Hadavar Mi'od is first, the Ficha is second, nefesh. and Lovavcha, yeah, Ficha and Lovavcha are interchangeable, and Nefesh is last. So what's Why is the, Nefesh and, and, and uh, speaking synonymous? Be, because the Targum, um, the Targum writes when it talks about when God created man that he could speak, he says Nefesh, that's how he explains the word. Nefesh Adab is the ability of Adam to speak, so therefore. Adam's, Adam's speaking and nefesh is the same. It is a nefesh, Targum says, that human beings, that they, you know, the ability to communicate and talk. So that's why, that's not his own, that's just already, that's just, he, he's just working with, that's what Chazal tell us. So it's not, so that's just a given. That, that's what, when we, when we say, Beficha, um, it's relating to, you know, talking, which is, you know, the same as nefesh. So why the contrast? <coughs> when it comes to Shema, we do first the heart, then the nefesh, then then the money. V'chol modecha. When it comes here, kikarav dava miyod, beficho v'vav chalas So 
the Divra Yechesko points out because when we're talking about the person in Shema, he already just was Shema Yisrael Hashem Akhan Hashem Akhan. He was somebody who's a Makabel Omachu Shamayim already. Someone who already gets it. He's already there. He's a Tzadik. So now we tell you, even Machol so that's the highest level. You could serve God with your heart, and then you go descending because He's ready for the, He's ready for the real stuff right away. But here we're talking about the mitzvah of tshuva. We're talking about someone who is chos there with tshuva, someone who's not there yet, and we want him to get there. So we know it's baby steps. You can't just jump to the chol That's the hardest level. The first you begin ma'odech with your money. We all know a person can give charity. If, you know, you have to have money, but if you have money, it's not a big deal. I don't have to change my lifestyle. You know, okay, here, give a couple of good causes and I'll continue living the way I want to. So that's the easiest thing. Start off with Mimodecha. Then the next thing is Nefesh, is talking about it. You know, New Year resolutions. You know, as we know, in January, the gyms are packed, but by February, March, they're already empty. You know, it's talk mm-hmm. is cheap. So it's at least the next step, get them talking about it, making resolutions trying to get better, and then after he gets, more, then he gets the money and the talk, then the ne- hopefully the next goal is then Gwavavka. So when it comes to Tshuva, it's first Kikaravadavamiyod, start with the money, then Beficha, talk is cheap, at least it's something, you're in the right direction, <laughs> and then ultimately Uvavavka, with serving God, you know, with your heart. And that's the Pshat. And in fact, that's what the Divri Yechesko points out. We have Allah in Baba Kama, it's called Yeish. It's something, as Allah is, if a person wants to bring a carbon, bring something and donate it to the temple, so you need two prerequisites. One, it has to be yours, it can't be stolen. But it also has to be in your possession now. So for instance, let's say someone loses something but didn't give up hope. There's Allah of Yeish. If you give up hope, so then the other person could acquire it as well. A lot of details, but we'll just get the basics. So let's say I lost an object, but I didn't give up hope. So it's still mine, but it's not in my possession. So I can't donate that object to the temple now. And the Gazlan can't either, because it might be in his possession, but he doesn't own it yet. What if it's a Motse? A Shabbat Aveda? Someone who finds one. No, but I'm saying as long as... I'm saying if the person... No, I'm saying if the person gave up hope, then... No, I'm, I'm then saying, you can give it yeah, as but, an offering. Yeah, exactly. But right now, I'm saying is, right now, the Gemara says, Shneinam eno mevian. The Balabas can't do it, and the Gazlin can't do it, because the Balabas still owns it, but it's not in his possessions. But the Gazlin can't do it either, because it's not his yet. It's in his possession, but he doesn't own it. It's still a stolen object. You need Jayush, what You need the Baal to give up hope for it to become yours. So what do we see the Zivar Yechesko points out that as long as you don't have Yeish, there's always hope. That we always, that as um, as the Kutzker, one of the great Hasidic, you know, Kutzker was, he was tough, as the, you know, the Kutzker, we're too sensitive today, I don't mean the two of you, society as a whole. Like a friend of mine was telling me, like, um, in, he has a shawl in Brooklyn, and, you know, he was the rub of the shawl, you know, a big shawl. And one time, you know, a guy who doesn't usually come shows up to Mincha Meyer or whatever, and he goes over and he says, oh, I guess you have your site tonight. He says, well, how did you know that there are a couple hundred people in this show? It's amazing how you keep track of everyone's your site. The rabbi said, no, I don't keep track. I never see you here. The only time you show up is your your site. That's how I knew it was your your site. Okay. After Meyer, he gets a call from the guy. He says, you know what? I was very offended by what you said today. But was it true? Oh, this is, this is a true story. Yeah. Right. Was it true? Well, of course it was true. But it's not the way you talk. We live in the world of the offended today. So basically, Cuts was, basically they say the Cuts Rebbe, when he was going around, he was very popular. Everyone wanted him for a, for a town rabbi. So he went to different towns. Everyone was saying how great he is, you know, giving him all the gifts. And he showed up in one town, they were throwing rocks at him, tomatoes. He said, this is a shtut. This is my kind of place. And that's the town. And so Cuts, you know, he basically gave it to you the way it was. No no politically correct ray. He said it the way it was. So, so Cuts Gareb was, oh, had a lot of sharp things to say. So he says, what's the pshat that when someone gives up hope, 
the luck is once he gives up hope, then the other person, whoever finds it now, gets to keep it. But it's necessarily a gazlan or any person. No, it's not necessarily, it. it's not necessarily a gazlan either. But any it's any any matzah can keep it if he doesn't know the other person still has hope. You know? No, but Shabbos already can't necessarily keep it. Depends. Um, no, right. I'm saying, but that's, I'm, I'm not getting, I'm, I'm not getting into separate shape. I'm not getting into the detail. But the point being here is, as long as you don't give up hope, the object is still yours. So the Rukhatska said it's a punishment. You know why someone who gives up hope loses it? Because it's an owner, a Jew should never give up hope. Uh, uh, you know, we always have, you know, it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu to turn to. And that's the so one of the biggest obstacles of tshuva is I feel it's too much, I can't do it. It's too much for me, for the rabbi, the kolel people, this guy, but you kidding me? I can't keep the Torah mitzvahs, I can't learn. And, and we just read, the, we asked a couple of weeks ago, Parashat Kiseitse, the parish of Yafas Toar, the beautiful woman that if they're fighting in the war and they find this beautiful woman they're attracted to. So the Torah goes different ways how you could um, have her. But as in Rashi quotes the Chazal, that lo dibra Torah ela keneged Sahara. The Torah is giving us a special dispensation. And we know sexual morality is very strong to begin with sexual desires, and plus the factor in war, to the combination, the Torah recognizes certain times it's just too much for a person to withstand temptation, but therefore the Torah makes it permitted in order that the, 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 that the desire should go away. But the point being is, Eishe Shafat's Torah, that, that parsha, God knows that it's too hard, but other times, you know, it's not too hard. So one of the biggest obstacles is it's too much to do. As in the Tzavim that you're talking about? The, the, the one Kisait, say the one... Before Kitavu? Yeah, Kisait is right before, it's right at the beginning of the parasha, Eishas Yafat's Toar. You know, I am doing the Tzavim, but that's what I'm talking about right now. And that's what they point out, that the person, you know, a Jew should never give up hope, because there's always hope for tshuva. And that's why, in fact, they write, this. a uh, Gemara tells us in Brachas, it's talking about entertaining guests. And you're, you're the balabas and this guest, so there's a rule the Gemara has that you should always listen to your, whatever the balabas says you do, chutz say, except if he tells you to get lost, then you don't have to listen to him. So that's just a, it's a luck in terms of, you know, um, guests and that. So in the Bali Kabbalah, the Zohar and others say, what is, who's the balabas? The Baal of us is God. Well, do whatever God tells you to mix this as you do. You always listen to God chutz when he says say, except when he tells you to get lost. In other words, even the famous story with Acher, with uh, Melio, with, with uh, Elisha, who became a person who became a heretic, and the Basco said, get away, God doesn't want you anymore. You don't listen to it. There's always, no matter how far, no matter how far you go, is never yeyosh. Is never giving up hope, and that's why. Um, and that's why. And that's why you say. And in fact, um, that's what. The, and that's what. The, and that's what they point out here. That the contrast in order by Shema you say v'chol avavcha, v'chol nafsha, v'chol modecha. Someone's already there, but someone who's not there, he's a choser b'tshuva. You got to take it step by step. You take it first modecha with the money, and then then. The ficha, then you know you talk about it, and ultimately, then after you know after a while, it's bechol avavka, and that's why a person has to realize you don't have to do everything at one time. In fact, Rosh Hashanah isn't a time for it; isn't time for tshuva. That's that's um, it's the zman of a Hashem made tshuva, but really, you won't be saying any. You won't find one asham, the one al chayd on Rosh Hashanah. It's all on Yom Kippur, because <coughs> Rosh Hashanah. It's all about the big picture. The, you know, the, the, let's say you, you're driving, you're in a boat, and you're going to some place, you're going on a cruise to Alaska, wherever you're going, and the captain's looking around and like, this doesn't look familiar. So he takes out his iPhone with his app with the compass and or his Android, and he says, wait a second, I wonder why we're going the wrong way. I was supposed to go 400 miles east, I went 400 miles west. What's the first thing the captain has to do? Know his estimation? Turn the ship around. You're still going to be a long, you're still going to have 800 miles to go, 
but you're heading in the right direction. That's what Shuvah is all about. No one's asking you, it's going to take a long time to go 800 miles. But as long as it shifts in the right direction, you're, you're on your way. And you don't have to, and, and you know, as, as we know, as, they, as, as the saying goes, haste makes waste. Sometimes you dip, do things too quickly. You see, you look around, the many Bali Chuva who took upon themselves to take too many things too quickly. And now they're no longer Bali Chuva anymore. They've lost it all. Like the Gravel and the Gon explains, it's spiritual ladder. Let's see, you're going up a ladder, so sometimes you could, t- you could go one rung, one to really feeling good, maybe you could do a second rung, or maybe really feeling good a third rung. But if you try to do four, you're going to fall off the ladder. It's not that you're going to go back to where you were, you're going to fall off and you're going to lose everything. It's the same way in spirituality. It has to be step by step. Or, you know, there's no, there's no commandment in the, like, you know, like, you know, there was a child, I think, that somebody asked about Moshe. The case was that the kid was in yeshiva from a non-observant home and he had to go back home and he did, and the parents threatened to take the kid out of yeshiva if they wouldn't bring him home. And it's a whole big issue with kosher. What is he going to do? So basically, Moshe, without the whole the details, but Moshe basically writes, you don't find anywhere, actually only by a gear, which is interesting, that well, you have to convert, well, you have to, you have to take everything, you have to commit to everything at one time. But by a, by a Jew, you never find that. You never find anywhere you have to take on... Of course, the ultimate goal is to try to keep it as much as you can, everything. But it's always step by step, one light, one, you know, one rung at a time. You try to take too much, you're left with nothing. And that's what you try to do too much, you're left with yeish. You give up hope and then you have nothing left. A Jew never, a Jew never gives up hope. So they point out... No, so I'll continue. So therefore, and therefore they point out that that's the concept. That's the concept as well of um, that's the concept as well. We point out with um, with with you know a person has to a person has to take on the big picture in terms of there was a time management class that's got in the. The, press, the professor was teaching university kids for graduate school and he, he took out a box and he took out big stones and he put the stones in the box and he said, is the box full? And they fell mm-hmm. for it. They said, yeah, it's full. He said, no, it's not. He went behind the desk, he pulled out the drawer and he started putting in little pebbles in between, in between the stones. And he said, is it full? They didn't fall for it anymore. He went out and he poured sand and he, and he poured sand in all the spots. And afterwards he poured water in. He said, yeah, now it is full. So what's the lesson? What lesson do you learn from that? He asked his students. So the student said, one student said, well, I guess in life you have to learn to fit things in between the cracks, which is true, but that wasn't the lesson he was giving. He said the point was, and it's very fitting before Rosh Hashanah, is in life you, you have to turn the ship around, you have to know where you're heading, you have to prioritize in life. There are many important things. Choosing good from bad is a lot easier than choosing good from good. You have a lot of good values, your Shalom bias at home, your kids, your job, helping other people, going to hospitals, learning. If, Life is full of making good choices, good versus good. And you, but for a person to prioritize, you have to make sure you put the big rocks in first. Because if you start off with the pebbles and the sand, you're not going to have any room for the big rocks. If you spend your time doing the quote-unquote less important things, you're not going to have time for the important things. So it's very important to prioritize and know exactly, we obviously have to know what the important things are, what are less important, and then you'll have room to fit everything in, you know, before Rosh Hashanah. So what's an example of a pebble in this context? No, so I'm not saying, so I'm just saying, you know, let's say, um, let's say, let's say Shalom Bayez family time is... Is that a rock or a pebble? Well, <laughs> I guess it depends. Right, so it could, it could be Shalom, let's, 
So, uh, well, it depends. That's what I'm saying. We could discuss what it is. Like, depends what the other things are. Obviously, it's, there's, you know, also could it, I don't know if it's, we don't have to say there's only one big thing. Let's say the rocks are Torah, Tefillah, Shalom Bayis, spending time with Jackie. You know, it's, those are the rocks. You know, then pebbles could be, you know, a little less than, you know, I'm not, I'm not limiting it to one thing. You know, whatever they are, I'm saying they're a little less essential, etc., etc. You know, that we could, we could say that, you know, that's a very important question to know exactly which one is what. But I'm saying. I was hearing yesterday. Um, Don't believe everything you hear. No, just kidding, yeah? But, but it was on the CBC. It must be true. Well, okay. <laughs> well, the guy has the clipboard, so it must be true. <laughs> Amazingly, it works only when you take a survey. Um, they, the, you know, there was, um, boy, how do I summarize this to sound feasible? That if, you know, a lot of our society today is all bent up on happiness. You know, to do, maximize happiness. And uh, one person gave the, one well, person is a philosopher, he gave the example that he had two children recently. And he said that his happiness has decremented enormously. He's much less happy than when he was before. Because right, he can't go out and do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. But he says his life is a lot more... He says he would take a bullet for his kids, but he is less happy. So, I mean, he's talking about how these things are now correlated. So, at the end of this whole lecture, they end up saying that if you're making decisions in life, if you're doing it based on the compass of what makes me happier, you will never go in any set direction. Whereas, if you try to, if those who have found something that is more important than they are, bigger than they are, so he gave the example of Martin Luther King, who took an enormous amount of pain in order to pursue something that was much more valuable. So he says that kind of thing and is very powerful. And he came back to Torah. He's a Jewish psychiatrist. Right, no, Jewish right, it gets, also gets, no, but it gets down to what what's the definition of simcha. There is what there is something to what he's saying. In fact that was um that was a hakel actually this week's parish also by Yelach, that the year after Shemitah, so once on the you know, after the seven years, the king and gets together and you read Sefer Zvarma from the people. So the beginning of Parish is by Yelach, Hakel so you have to take Anoshim Noshim Vitaf. You take the men, women and kids. So the Chazal has kids why, why do we bring the kids, you know, little kids, like they don't know anything, a two-month-old baby or a three-year-old kid. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Rashi writes, quotes the Chazal, to give schar for the people who are bringing them. To, you know, because as you might say, because some man's like, what do you mean? If I wanted to, if I wanted to do something meaningful, I do, it will be a lot more if I don't have my kids hanging all over me, going back. So some version point out, but that's, that's part of that's part of priority. Sometimes we see that you have to some, sometimes sacrifice for you. You know, we see from Hakel that sometimes you have to sacrifice your own your own in order for the sake of the kids. Of course, people do it in other extremes. I know people say, oh, "I'll do anything," you know, from, for the for the kids that are willing to come to Minyan or learn Torah, but for themselves they don't do anything. That's Ultimately, Say that again? I know parents who, for the kids, they'll do everything. They'll come to learning. They'll come to davening. For the but, kids. Yeah, because the kids, so the kids see them, but they themselves, they don't have any interest in it. In other words, so that's not good either. I'm saying you have to sacrifice for the kids, but ultimately it has to come from you. But just to conclude, that on the simcha part, we we say that we have the mitzvah of writing a sefer Torah, and it has the word va'ata now. And ain't not and 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 vata the medrash writes now is always a time of um, it's always a time of uh, simcha we'll see so what's but what's the atah right now right now you're writing a sefer Torah so the Torah is called kisur chemes hashira hazos it's called the shira so a person to be happy in life for a person they have to see the simcha sachayim they have to see what they're doing. In other words, they, if they, you know, if they see the sweetness of Torah, let's say the, the enjoyment of Torah, if a person goes you're doing things they don't like all day, they're going to be miserable. The person has to, you know, when you learn Torah, you have to view it as a shira and something. But of course, but 
that's a whole separate share, but that's definitely true. You have to you have to know how to weigh and balance your own obligations, how to deal with your kids, and doesn't mean you don't have to love being with your kids every second. Doesn't mean it's not meaningful. You, it's a mitzvah of chinuch, teaching them different things. It doesn't like for instance, it says honor your mother and father. You don't necessarily have to love your parents. Obviously, some parents are more lovable than others. But the point is, you have to honor the institution. They put you in the world. So, and in fact, that's why, to conclude, that's why also Ezra instituted to read the portion of Kisavu right before Rosh Hashanah, because it's the portion of Hakaras Hatov, of recognizing Bikurim, the first is recognizing that everything belong, that everything comes from Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and we also have to realize Hakaras Hatov to our fellow friends and human beings as well, because someone who is an ingrate, it's, it's a fundamental of creation is to acknowledge the good that people do for you. If you're a ingrate, you're a kafa biyikr, you're like an apikaris. And in fact, what's the definition of a Jew, a Yehudi? What does the word mean from hoda? You thank acknowledge you. and you admit, you realize, every have to thank HaKadosh Baruch, and that's why it's, by, by, by the Chazaras Hashats, we have the Chazan Davin for us. There's one tefillah where <coughs> we do it ourselves. Modim? Modim for Hakaras Atov, there's no so we got to do it ourselves. You can't have, we can't send someone else to acknowledge, and that's what happened, you know, throughout. And that's why um, we read Parshas Bikur and Parshas Kisavo before Rosh Hashanah. But it is a fundamental that we have to have, uh, you know, Hakaras Atov. Not like the butler who will Zacharis Yosef. He didn't remember Yosef what he did for him by Yishkachel, and he forgot him. He's considered an ingrate. But that's one of the fundamental voracious, Vishvio Rashis, because of Bikurim, the world was created. Hakaras Atov is a fundamental, that's the Yesod of honoring his parents, that's the Yesod of life, and that's what we have to recognize. Because someone who is an ingrate, besides being a uh, Apikaris, is going to be miserable anyway. You have these people walking around, don't appreciate anything they have, they're always complaining and whining. It's a pre you have a moral obligation to be happy. Not necessarily, even not only for yourself, for your spouse, for someone else. No one likes to be around miserable people. Mm-hmm. And therefore, that's what, the, that's what Ezra instituted, all these different concepts, to read Parshas, the Tochacha before, that we should finish off the year, <coughs> finish off all the curses, and begin Rosh Hashanah, you know, with the blessings.